Okay, so welcome everyone to the second of the semester one 2022 Institute of Historical Research, Transport and Mobility History seminar series. Um, I'm Charlotte Matheson and I'm one of the co-conveners. We've got Mike Esbester here on the Transport and Mobility History seminar um, account, keeping the tech running. Thank you, Mike. Um, and we will get on to introducing this session in a moment. But first of all, I'm just going to start by reminding everyone of our next session, which is on the 15th of December. And this is going to be the first of our hybrid sessions. So we'll be joined by Murray Seacombe from Lancaster. Um, and Mike's just put the link to that in the chat. Um, we will be in person back in Senate House. It's been a while, um, but we'll be very excited to be back in Senate House house in London um, for an in-person portion of the seminar. Um, so we'll be, be there um, in the room and all the details are on the booking link, but we will also be online and fingers crossed um, streaming it live as well via Zoom in the usual way. So hopefully um, you can also enjoy from the comfort of your own home. Um, and we're really pleased and we really want to keep going the really you know, wonderful, warm, international community that we've managed to kind of um, be joined by over the last couple of years. So we hope that these hybrid sessions are going to be a way to facilitate the best of both worlds. Um, so we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you then. Um, sign up, um, whether you're coming in person or online via the booking link. And that's on the 15th of December. But this evening, um, well, a, a wonderful testament to our kind of international um, reach at the moment, as we are joined all the way from Chicago by Trish Brudar, who um, is going to speak to us about walking um, and women's walking, which is actually another wonderful first for us because I don't think we've had walking so far out of all the modes of transport um, and mobility history um, that we've covered. So it's um, really exciting, really looking forward to this. So Trish is a postdoctoral fellow in the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities at Northwestern University. She received her PhD in English from the University of Notre Dame in 2021, and her research focuses on representations of physical mobility in British literature of the long 19th century. She's currently working on a book project, which is um, what we're going to hear from this evening, and that examines the figure of the walking women in novels and life writing. And this past spring, she was also in London, um, beginning work on a second project which explores the role of homelessness in the Victorian literary imagination with support from an early career research fellowship at the Institute of English Studies. And her work is published and forthcoming in um, venues including Victorians, European Romantic Review, Modernism, Modernity Print Plus and Victorian Literature and Culture. So I will hand over now to Trish and we will get going and as always have time for questions at the end but feel free to put them in the chat as we go along as well. Welcome Trish. Wonderful, thank you so much Charlotte for that introduction uh, and thank you to the seminar organizers for this invitation. So let me do the screen sharing bit. So I obviously can't talk and do this at the same time. Okay, so you should all be seeing my slides. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So let me move you all to a more convenient location. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm excited to share today some of my research on walking in women's diaries. Um, and I will note that a version of this work should be out soon from Victorian literature and culture. So if you, you sit through this talk and still want to know more, <laughs> uh, there should be a, an official version out in the world before long. Um, okay, so I'm just going to dive right in. So on a fine September morning in 1813, 22-year-old Sarah Hibbert's father and brother set out in the carriage, leaving the women of the family to occupy themselves with a the stroll through the neighboring woodlands. At first glance, this arrangement reifies an expected gender division, pairing men with, bride, with wide ranging travel and women with domestic stasis. Yet Hibbert recording the day's events in her diary efficiently punctures this expectation. My father and William set out for Manchester, Liverpool. We went out on a voyage of discovery through the Highly Woods. Hibbert's language invites comparison between these two excursions. The two halves of the sentence balanced across a long dash prompt the reader to consider how the men's trip to the city stacks up against the ladies' voyage of discovery. The diarist's dramatic language and underscoring of key words tips the balance in favor of the women's expedition, 
presenting their ram ramble through the woodlands as alive with the possibility for discovery and adventure. Hibbert's is one among scores of unpublished diaries that record the striking extent to which walking structured and animated the lives of women in the leisured classes of, the of 19th century Britain. Today, I'll draw from, over, from a corpus of over 100 such volumes that I consulted across a number of major and provincial archives with the aim of reorienting our understanding of the walking woman's role in 19th century British culture. So broadly speaking, the position of the female pedestrian in this era has typically been described within two key paradigms, invisibility and transgression. As Carrie Andrews points out in her recent book, Wanderers, the history of walking has always been women's history, though you would not know it from what has been published on the subject. The general historical narrative is that alongside the revolution in transportation technology that took place across the long 19th century, Another somewhat quieter cultural revolution was taking place around the simple act of walking. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau, William Hazlitt, William Wordsworth, Charles Dickens, and other major literary figures were instrumental in helping to elevate an apparently mundane act into a profound, poetic, and potentially radical exercise. Indeed, literature and walking are so intertwined that in 1902, we have Leslie Stephen claiming all great men of letters have been enthusiastic walkers. Exceptions, of course, accepted. And looking at the literary lineage of walking that has been recapitulated over the intervening century in various accounts, we might also say that all great literary walkers have been men. Exceptions, of course, accepted. So even today, um, as Deidre Hedden and Kathy Turner have recently demonstrated, the lineage of major peripatetic writers outlined in scholarly and popular literature remains predominantly male, with some of the usual suspects gathered here. It's just kind of a quick rundown of the names I most often see. Uh, and we also have a small handful of women, some of whom I've listed here, such as Jane Austen, Dorothy Wordsworth, and Virginia Woolf, who are often present in these accounts as representatives of those women who were bold enough to make incursions into pedestrian culture but without much ability to kind of shape its foundations. And there are certainly practical reasons for this marginalization of women within the canon of great walkers. Historically, women have not had the same freedom of movement as their male counterparts. Because they often required a chaperone or a companion, women were less able to access the sense of autonomy and in William Hazlitt's words, the perfect liberty that has long been considered a natural corollary of pedestrian travel. And I'll return to these quotations a bit later in the talk. So further, women's mobility has notoriously carried associations with sexual impropriety, from the streetwalker or the fallen woman to the controversial figure of the female flaneur or the rural courtship custom of walking out, Many scholars have illustrated how the walking woman's body is consistently read as a locus of suspicion, condemnation, and vulnerability. So with this discourse in mind, it is easy to see why when scholars have argued for women's inclusion in the history of walking, they often turn to ideas of transgression or rebellion. Deborah Lutz, for example, draws together the lives and works of Dorothy Wordsworth, Jane Austen, Anne Lister, and the Bronte sisters to claim that because of the widespread belief that there was something not quite correct with the wayfaring woman, the act of walking became a recognized form of defiance. And critics are often drawn to moments of conflict where this defiance is made visible. So just to give a few examples, there's the moment when Dorothy Wordsworth draws criticism from her aunt Crackenthorpe from rambling about the country on foot, or when in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, Carolyn Bingley and Mrs. Hurst read Elizabeth Bennett's decision to walk to Netherfield and the resulting mud upon her dress as an indication of an abominable sort of conceited independence. Or when, in Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, the solitary wandering heroine meets with distrust from those she encounters. How doubtful must have appeared my character, position, and tale. So across the long 19th century, in life writing and fiction alike, we can certainly find ample evidence of the barriers faced by female pedestrians and of the ways that women writers push back against those barriers. So my aim today is not to dispute this evidence, but to expand our critical accounts of women's walking to better account for the understudied majority of women's walking that did not rise to the level of defiance. <clears throat> 
um, and that's intentionally blank, so <laughs> don't worry. Uh, that is, while there is no question that women were rarely able to move about as freely as men, women certainly did walk in a variety of contexts and for any number of reasons as a matter of course. However, most of our analytical frameworks for understanding walking's cultural role have their origins in masculine peripatetic traditions with the effect that our analyses often tend to kind of reproduce this marginalization of the female pedestrian. So we can take the flaneur as a very classic example of this. So the flaneur is the iconic leisure male pedestrian theorized by Walter Benjamin uh, based on the 19th century work of Charles Baudelaire. And it's proved a really generative figure for thinking about the role of the modern urban pedestrian. Following Janet Wolfe's famous provocation um, in, in the 80s that the female flaneur or the flaneuse was a character rendered impossible by the sexual divisions of the 19th century, a significant amount of scholarship has taken up the question of whether and how women could have access to this mode of mobile experience. And this conversation has improved incredibly generative for sort of inserting women into this history of walking, but it still kind of reifies the centrality of the flaneur. Whether the flaneuse is imagined as invisible or defiant, oppressed or liberated, she's always defined against the norm that was theorized with little consideration for women's lived experience. So my aim as in the project as a whole, and particularly for my work on diaries, is to try and construct a literary historical analysis of the walking woman that takes forms of mobility practiced and represented by women as sort of its starting point. So by starting with how women conceptualize their own mobility, rather than the structures of power that constrained them, we can better recognize the ways that frequent walking from routine turns around the garden to fine scrambles along country lanes to excursions into the unknown was an essential part of how many 19th century women experienced the world. So in quest of this everyday mobility, um, I assembled a corpus of journals and diaries written by women who are not famous and whose narratives remain for the most part unstudied by contemporary scholars. They are, they, they are diverse in age, uh, ranging from 16 to 70, and diverse in regional identity within England, but are pretty homogenous in being white, mostly English, and belonging to what we might roughly term the leisured classes. In other words, my corpus is generally confined to those whose social status, literacy, and leisure allowed them to keep diaries that found their way into the archives. So while I aim to lay the groundwork for a more expansive understanding of 19th century gendered mobility, I'm only able to make claims about a specific subset of female pedestrians here with the understanding that the available practices and meanings of walking looked quite different for other groups and individuals. Um, and I'd be very happy to discuss that in the Q&A as well. So um, encompassing almost the entire 19th century, my corpus spans a period of British history during which the evolving transportation technologies reshaped how people experienced mobility. So while some shifts in the cultural role of walking are inevitable in this century of rapid change, I am most interested here in threads of continuity that will allow us to make kind of broad observations about women's everyday mobility. Similarly, though my corpus does skew more towards rural and provincial settings, I refrain from drawing a strict sort of urban versus rural divide, particularly so many diarists in this study move frequently back and forth between the two. So as a form, diaries are attentive to the minutia of daily life, making them useful records for routine practices of walking. They're also one of the few ways that narratives of non-famous unpublished English women have come to be preserved. And I've specifically focused on accounts that were not apparently intended for publication, um, in part to bring new voices into our accounts, um, but also sort of guided by the assumption that these are somewhat less shaped by the pressures of audience. Um, however, that requires some qualification. Um, first, as with any recorded narrative, it's important to recognize that diaries are mediated representations, not transparent accounts of lived experience. And despite a growing sense of diaries as private documents around this time, they were still often circulated among family members and friends and were subject to being read or even amended by others. So I think this lack of privacy should warn us away from reading diaries as confessional documents. And indeed, the manuscripts I examined for this project contain disappointingly little information that is obviously private or sensitive or controversial. 
So it seems fair to assume that diarists experienced frustrations and restrictions that they would not have felt comfortable setting down in ink. So we can't assume that women's diaries provide comprehensive accounts of mobility, but we can, I think, accept the physical movements and reported sensations they do record as valid and important experiences that are particularly, particularly able to illuminate walking's less transgressive facets and everyday functions. So with these limitations in mind, I use the reported subjective experiences of mobility to, in these diaries to gesture towards a historically situated phenomenology of walking. Based on the common threads I observe across the corpus, I propose the term everyday adventure to describe walking status as an unremarkable and familiar act that nevertheless creates the potential for event and variety. I will begin by fleshing out this paradigm, showing how Dyer's descriptions of everyday walks regularly kind of trouble this boundary between routine and excitement, habit and change, familiarity and exploration. I then move to a consideration of the social and relational nature of pedestrian activity, showing how these diarists' accounts challenge the idea prevalent in scholarly and popular accounts of walking, that walking is a primarily individual and autonomous act. And then finally, by way of conclusion, I return to the question of the, female the transgressive female pedestrian through the life writing of Nellie Wheaton, a prolific and often solitary walker whose refusal to be seen as a, quote, singular female might usefully challenge our own critical practices when it comes to analyzing women's mobility. So drawing on the sense of extraordinariness within the ordinary that we saw promised by Sarah Hibbert's Voyage of Discovery, I propose the term everyday adventure to characterize the role of walking in the lives of 19th century women. The term slightly paradoxical nature captures the way in which pedestrian excursions can oscillate between or even blend together an ordinary habitual activity with opportunities for deviation and event. Described by Rebecca Solnit as, quote, the most obvious and the most obscure thing in the world, end quote, walking occupies an appropriately liminal position in the diaries in this study. That is, it's a pervasive activity, so habitual that it often threatens to slip below the horizon of narratability. In one representative entry, for example, diarist Helena Larmouth reports, nothing particular happened today. I went for a walk around the village. In remarkably similar language, Frances Denman begins a brief entry, nothing particular, I walked and afterwards we read. The phrase nothing particular situates walking as a mundane occurrence, hardly worthy of remark. Yet both diarists then go on to single out walking as a feature of their day, thus making it particular despite its apparent mundaneness. Indeed, on some days, it is the only thing worth mentioning. Numerous diaries feature full entries such as walked out or took a walk, etc. Other diarists are even more attentive to their daily strolls, noting details like location, time, or weather quality for their walks almost every day. So thus, walking is a pervasive presence in the diaries, and even then we can assume that many strolls and rambles go unrecorded. For example, the presence of phrases such as, I did not feel well, so did not walk, or simply did not walk at all, in some entries, serve to illustrate that walking is taken for granted as a daily activity that in some cases might only be recorded as an absence. Altogether then, we can see that pedestrian excursions were an indispensable activity for many 19th century English women, one that garners enough interest from diarists to be mentioned frequently and sometimes described at length, um, often receiving more attention than activities like dining or domestic work. So establishing walking as the stuff of daily life is thus a fairly straightforward task. Yet it is worth pausing over the concept of the everyday, which carries its own definitional complexities and legacies among feminist thought and peripatetic theory. Rita Felsky's influential discussion of this strangely elusive category provides a useful starting point for my discussion of everyday mobility. Felsky seeks to give serious theoretical consideration to the everyday without elevating it or abstracting it to the point where it loses its, quote, mundane, taken for granted, routine qualities. This represents an important departure from the work of Michelle de Certeau, for example, whose influential account of urban walking positions the idiosyncratic and ephemeral movements of the pedestrian as a kind of subtle but powerful resistance to the panoptic discipline represented by the God's eye view of the city planners. This account, Certeau's that is, 
Though alluring in the power it grants to the pedestrian does draw us inevitably back towards a formulation of walking as resistance. And it also gives the everyday a heroic quality that kind of jars against its very everydayness, as Felsky points out. So by contrast, Felsky offers a more descriptive account of the everyday that focuses on three facets. There in this lower quote, uh, repetition, its temporality, sense of home, which is its spatial order, and habit, which is its mode of experience. And these I find resonate with some of the most pervasive experiences um, of walking I encountered. At a fundamental level, of course, walking is an act of sort of repetitive rising and falling of feet. Uh, its ability to fade into a rhythmic background is what has made it a celebrated activity for contemplation. More particularly though, the diarists in this study highlight walking as a repeated daily action that often plays out along habitual routes. And it is through this sense of repetition and habit that a sense of home coalesces around the act of walking. Whereas Felsky conceptualizes home as, quote, a base which allows us to make forays into other worlds, but whose boundaries are sort of leaky and porous, from a mobility standpoint, it might be helpful to think of home not as a static base, but as a somewhat malleable and portable connection to place that often develops through physical movement. Um, Tim Ingold and others have written eloquently about the ways that we develop knowledge and geographical intimacy through walking, or in Ingold's words, quote, along the myriad paths we take as we make our ways through the world in the course of everyday activities. As pedestrians tread and retread familiar paths, they inscribe and expand the boundaries of home, creating and maintaining both social and geographical connections. So we can thus understand walking as a quintessentially everyday activity in which repetition, habit, and home kind of coalesce around off-trodden circuits um, of exercise, errands, and social calls. Yet even as walking is prototypically everyday, it is also a highly malleable form of mobility. A casual stroll can easily extend further outward, deviate on a whim from a habitual route, or create new permutations. The simple act of moving through space on foot creates the possibility for disruption, deviation, and the unexpected. Even the everyday walk along a country lane, I propose, can take on a space time of, quote, meetings and adventures that Mikhail Bakhtin has theorized around the literary chronotope of the road. It is this aleatory quality that leads me to formulate the idea of the everyday adventure. So my understanding of adventure as it applies in this setting allows us in particular to reassess the role of the body in representations of the walking woman. Everyday behaviors as described by Felsky often become semi-automatic. Our bodies go through the motion while our minds are elsewhere. A similar effect often occurs in the act of walking. As the quote father of pedestrianism, Jean-Jacques Rousseau puts it, whereas my body has nothing to do while walking, <laughs> my soul remains active, still producing feelings and thoughts. Our ability to relegate the physical work of movement to the background allows us, allows walking to be a product, productive activity for generating thought. It also allows us to carry on a conversation or enjoy our surroundings while we're on the move. But as several feminist critics have pointed out, the reduction of physicality to nothing and the position of the body as merely an obstacle to philosophical reverie is part of a gendered mind-body hierarchy that has long been intertwined with women's marginalization in our cultural narratives around walking. Women as that locus of sexual attention are never allowed to become disembodied in the same way. In the diaries, however, we find several useful alternative perspectives on how women view their physicality when it comes to the act of walking. So adventure as described by John Uri involves the body as spatially situated, experiencing and knowing the world through being and moving around in it. This sounds a lot like Ingold's description of everyday walking, and indeed, or he's drawing here from Ingold's concept of wayfinding, but with a slight change in emphasis. So here we have a temporarily heightened physical engagement and a change in attention um, in the ways that we move through the world, where we sort of move from semi-automatic to primary focus in terms of that physical engagement. So we see some diarists uh, intentionally seeking out this kind of break with routine. For example, when diarist Elm Letitia Phillips tours the Lake District with her family in 1842, she feels called to step off the prescribed path. Although surrounded by, by scenery, quote, so awfully grand that we were almost afraid to be left alone, 
Phillips is not cowed, but instead, quote, I determined to climb up a mountain. I got up so high that I could not move, so I sat down and slipped at such a rate down again that I was afraid I should break my head, I think, maybe hand, break something, uh, but I got down safely. Here, Phillips temporarily breaks from the established path to pursue a sense of adventure that seems only heightened by the body's undignified and potentially dangerous descent. After making it down in one piece, she simply rejoins her group and they move on to the next destination without commentary. If Phillips is in any way censured or chastised for her impulsive determination, she does not record it. At other times, this heightened physicality is interrupted, interruptive and unexpected. On October 28, 1891, 16-year-old Helena Larmus stroll around the local village, and you'll remember she was one of the sort of uh, nothing in particular people <laughs> from earlier, uh, is rudely interrupted. I was walking along when I felt myself pushed violently forward. Turning indignantly around, I discovered that my adversary was a goat. This adversary chases her through the village. It butted me all the way until at last I was forced to take refuge in a shop. I couldn't help laughing, although I was very much annoyed. It looked so very undignified to run through the village high street with a goat hotly pursuing and butting at you. <laughs> so we can see here how the everydayness of a walk around the village creates the conditions for deviation from the norm, where simply being out on foot is what creates the possibility for incident. This episode also playfully subverts our expectations of the violence and spectacle of female pedestrianism. As Larma finds herself violently assaulted and subject to indignity, presumably in front of a public audience, but sort of remains in a purely comic mode. This incident obviously doesn't minimize the genuine threats affecting female pedestrians, but it does usefully remind us that physical vulnerability can also be about ridiculousness, levity, and laughter. So a final point I would like to make regarding this idea of the everyday adventure and the status of the body within that paradigm is the way in which diarists represent their encounters with dirt and muck. One of the surprising findings of my research was the extent to which women attack, attached a positive affect to those moments when walking becomes um, a very sort of dirty <laughs> business. So this runs against con conventional wisdom, which would suggest that wading through mud is an unseemly and little discussed activity for ladies, particularly at the height of the Victorian period. Also absent in such moments is any concern about the connection between physical and moral uncleanliness, two discourses that were very often linked in 19th century discourse, particularly when gender is in the picture. Phillips, for example, reports enjoying a scramble down at the village by a dirty lane before dinner with her mother and sister. Here joy produced by the excursion is specifically linked to the dirtiness of the road, while the term scramble implies a heightened physical engagement with the landscape. Even frustrated travelers seem to enjoy detailing the extent of their mucky misery. So here we have Margaret Ann Croom describing being prevented from completing a call by quote, excessive dirt, which threatened to leave me stuck in the mire. I reached home in a terrible state. Uh, and I've included the, the picture of this, you can see her really, her emphatic underlining uh, of some of these words. So Raccoon's repeated underscoring here conveys a heightened sense of emotion, which can certainly be interpreted as a frustration, but also perhaps a kind of perverse enjoyment of this moment's challenge and its excess. Even when Frederica Constance Legat in the bottom quote there describes traveling a road so filthily muddy that we had to walk with our petticoats up above our knees, there is nothing to suggest concern or distress at such unladylike behavior. Rather, the diary entry moves briskly along to the next important event, how to meet tea at seven. All of these dirty scrambles notably fail to evoke the embarrassment, shame, or disgust that we might expect. If walking is an indispensable and invaluable part of everyday life, dirt is accepted as a necessary and even pleasurable part of the journey. Thus far then, we have seen the act of walking emerge as part of a texture of daily life. We have seen how it introduces variety and even unladylike comportment into everyday narratives, but without attracting much censure or suspicion. I now wanna take a moment to draw our attention to a significant element of these narratives that I have not discussed, which is the fact that walking in nearly all of these accounts is a sociable and companionate activity. As I alluded to earlier in my talk, our male peripatetic tradition is in large part undergirded by ideals of individualism, liberty, and autonomy. 
Yet, as these diaries suggest, walking was a predominantly social activity. I want to make clear here that I'm not suggesting that these social or companion dynamics are specific necessarily to women's walking, but rather that the prim primacy of solitary walking has shaped the marginalization of women within this history, particularly as they have caretaking responsibilities, housework, uh, and aforementioned other restrictions on their mobility, which prevented them from kind of striking off on these long and solitary journeys that are often highlighted. Looking back at some of the quotations I've mentioned today, you can already see that walking is typically companionate. You can note the prevalence of the pronoun we and the sense of play and solidarity that is operative, for example, in Hibbert's Voyage of Adventure, Legat or Legat's wade through knee-deep mud. Though diaries certainly can and do walk alone, this is often differentiated from a more typical social walks. So uh, Lady Elizabeth Ingleby, for example, um, marks these moments specifically by referring to her aloneness. So I took a, I took a turn alone, or I walked alone and enjoyed it much. So one aim of my larger project is to ask how our overall understanding of walking's cultural role might shift if we accorded as much significance to walking's relational aspects as we do to its capacity to express independence. Which, as I mentioned, um, has often been a hallmark of both literary and theoretical accounts of walking in the 19th century and today. And these are just a few examples of the types of remarks that are often made. The idea of liberty, the idea of sort of leaving all of your social connections behind, um, and then this idea of walking as sort of um, constituting yourself as a coherent sort of individual organism or as a bodily mode of experiencing freedom. Not only is this pattern bound up with gender, but as disability theorist Michael Oliver pointed out, the persistent valorization of walking, particularly in this individualistic vein, often has the unintended effect of positioning those who cannot walk or who cannot walk alone as less than fully human. As Tim Creswell, Gerard Gog, and others have discussed, um, there are far-reaching impacts of this discourse um, in both sort of literature, culture, and policy. 19th century women's diaries actually provide a helpful counterbalance to this primacy of the solitary walker. Not only do they reveal walking as a companion activity, but in documenting years or even a lifetime of everyday experiences, they remind us that independent mobility is really often a provisional rather than a permanent state, as diarists and people within their social circle inevitably experience um, illness, injury, and other conditions that limit their mobility. For a particularly rich example of the diverse forms of care, sociality, and interdependence that coalesce around pedestrian mobility, I want to turn to the writings of Ellen Letitia Phillips, who I'm realizing has featured quite prominently in this talk, um, and Fanny Blathwaite. Uh, these two were sisters who were both keeping diaries in the mid-1800s and whose accounts um, often sort of overlap or line up. Um, and I know this is small, I'll kind of uh, pull out some of these specific examples. But when Fanny falls seriously ill in 1850, following the birth of her first child, Ellen's diaries, diary details her recovery through a shifting landscape of mobility. And what I've presented here are just a few selections of a much longer and more detailed account of uh, Fanny's progression. Uh, and there's also you know, other interspersed social activities that I've taken out uh, for the sake of fitting it onto a slide. Um, but here we see um, Fanny shift from sort of being carried from one room to another, just like down to a couch um, in the early stages of her illness, to eventually being taken outdoors on a litter by a whole team of people, and then um, pushed in a garden chair. This um, is used for quite a while and sort of periodically walking independently within that healing process. So in these examples, we see mobility as a truly collaborative process. So in the first instance um, of her excursion on the litter, which is here, um, we have uh, her carried by her husband and another man, I think a servant, um, just placed there on the litter, carried by sort of a rotation of people. And we also have the companionship of her infant by her side, giving her a flower, nice little gesture there. Um, and then later when Fanny is able to go out in the garden chair, she resumes this circuit of social visits that's very much part of daily life for both of these women. 
And they very often encounter friends on the road. Um, sometimes those friends sort of stop and take charge of pushing the chair for a bit. Uh, there's one instance, which I don't think is on here, where they show up at a friend's house and pretend that Fanny has walked the whole way uh, to like create this illusion of a magical recovery. So it's, it's very much part of the daily life um, and, and often in a very playful way. We can also see Ellen's careful documentation and celebration of Fanny's progress as an important act of care keeping a record for Fanny while her diary lies untouched for months. And importantly here, recognizing walking's relationality is not incompatible with celebrating independent mobility. We can read the excitement of Fanny's, quote, first walk around the garden on August 30th and the accomplishment um, on October 16th of doing above a mile's walking. But the sort of attention to relationality allows us to register that even here, human connections are very much part of the significance of the moment. Told then from the perspective of diaries like these, the story of the 19th century pedestrian might emerge not as that of a solitary wanderer, but rather of membership within an interdependent social and familial landscape of mobility. So in the final section of my talk today, I want to return to the idea of the transgressive female pedestrian. For most women in this study, the limits and constrictions on their movements remain either implicit or unrecorded, with very few mentions of censure or threat thereof. In order to get a clearer sense of the relationship between transgressive and socially acceptable mobilities, I will turn now to the life writing of Nellie Wheaton. So to give a very brief sketch of what is a pretty fascinating life, Wheaton grows up in I guess, genteel poverty, we could call it following her father's death at sea. Um, her father was in fact a captain in the slave trade and Wheaton is actually named after uh, a slave ship called the Nelly. But the fortune that he makes uh, through these ill-gotten means actually never reach his family. So Wheaton instead helps her mother run a day school in Up Holland. And then after her mother's death, she runs it single-handedly. She endures extreme isolation and privation while supporting her brother's education. And Wheaton later goes on to serve as a lady's companion, a governess, and secures a modest income through some property rentals before marrying rather suddenly at the age of 37. She's quite old for the time. Her husband, Aaron Stock, quickly proves to be abusive and tyrannical. Wheaton's brother is an extremely poor ally. And so at last, when Wheaton sees death or confinement in a madhouse as her only possible futures, a deed of separation is procured, which frees Wheaton from her husband's house, but severely restricts her right to visit her daughter, bans her from the town of Wigan where they lived, and makes her dependent on an allowance that stock controls. Throughout her life, uh, Wheaton preserved her narrative in neat volumes comprised of journal entries and copies of her correspondence sort of interspersed. Several of these volumes were later recovered and published in the 1930s by a Wigan book collector, Edward Hall. And Wheaton has since attracted modest critical attention in part because of her extraordinary penchant for walking. For instance, during a month in London, she tracks her mileage, um, racking up a total of 213 and three quarter miles, remarking appreciatively, I am astonished at my own strength. Wheaton's walking was solitary and often explicitly unconventional, which sets her apart from the other women I've discussed today. Yet I would also suggest that Wheaton's pedestrianism illustrates many of those sort of everyday adventure qualities I have described. For instance, Wheaton's habit of recording mileage in London becomes part of a new daily routine. Um, and we find these little small notations tucked into most of her journal entries thereafter. Uh, even when she's talking about something really dramatic like losing her daughter, she'll be like 14 miles <laughs> that day. Uh, thus, her extraordinary walks are literally set down in ink as an everyday practice, the nothing in particular that underwrites so many diaries in this study. Furthermore, Wheaton herself repeatedly downplays her exceptional status in an effort to protect her personal experiences of walking from being distorted and dramatized by other, others. And it is this in particular I want to keep in mind um, as I wrap up my talk. So one of Wheaton's more Daring adventures was to repeatedly visit her child despite her husband's obstruction by walking seven miles across the countryside to her daughter's boarding school to kind of intercept her there. 
So one morning, uh, she sets out alone to walk to Par Hall, which was the school, to see my little darling, Mary. I told no one where I was going. Apart from the secretiveness, Wheaton gives little indication that her actions are transgressive. She frames the excursion in pragmatic terms, marking the difficulties of not being well acquainted with the road and prioritizing above all the desire to see her child. So again, human relations are still a key motivator of her mobility. The excursion is successful, though mother and daughter are allowed only a brief reunion until the schoolmaster sends Wheaton away. Unfeeling being, knowing that I had walked seven or eight miles and had to walk as many more. While Wheaton is not treated kindly here, there's little sense that her walking itself is viewed askance. Indeed, in the published text, the only shock we encounter is from the editor, Hall, who at one point adds in a footnote, only a bold or shameless woman would have dared a lonely footpath walk at this time. Indeed, Wheaton is bold or shameless enough to transform the unfamiliar journey to Parr Hall into a habitual route that she modifies as needed to evade stocks restrictions or even intercept her daughter during the course of, her student, of the student's daily walks. Having traveled many miles back and forth alone and without incident, Wheaton later brushes off any safety concerns in a letter to her daughter, part of her rationale being that I never was robbed by strangers not so subtly suggesting that she had more to fear from her acquaintances and relations than from unknown aggressors, which definitely proved true, uh, Wheaton firmly eschews any attempt to sensationalize her movements. So I'll conclude now with a final example of Wheaton's refusal to be labeled as a transgressive walking woman. Her most famous expedition was a solo ascent of Snowdon in Wales, and this was made sometime after her separation and near the end of the, the extent account that we have. So her scramble is well underway when stopping for a drink at a stream, she sees a gentleman and his guide descending. Unable to conceal herself before they espied her, she moves further off the path, purposefully that they might not distinguish my dress or features, lest seeing me at any other time, they should know where they had seen me and I should dread the being pointed out in the road on the street as that is the lady I saw ascending Snowden alone. In this moment, Wheaton imagines herself as an object of spectacle. Her practices of mobility disrupted not only here on the mountain, but out in the road and on the streets. Refusing to allow such a possibility, she remains quite deaf to their calls. And when finally forced to hear, she briefly acknowledges their offer of help, but insistently moves on alone. Quote, I never turned my face toward them, but walked fast as I could, hanging down my head. Hanging her head, not in shame, but in self-defense, Wheaton seeks to avoid being made the object of a narrative beyond her control. I had no fancy to be the heroine of a tale for him to amuse future employers with, and to describe me as young or old, handsome or plain, ladylike or otherwise. She goes on to envision herself as a newspaper anecdote of a singular female. I am not thus ambitious. No, no. In this moment of near exposure, Wheaton's awareness of the walking woman's public image is suddenly rendered painfully visible. The proliferation of roles, heroine, singular female, ladylike, otherwise, point to the female pedestrians in instability as a signifier, even as they suggest the figure's eminent narratability, a story poised to circulate on the streets and in newsprint. Wheaton's story might take on any number of reductive and untrue forms, none of which would capture her sense of accomplishment of reaching the peak where she crowns herself queen of the mountains. Wheaton's writings highlight a revealing tension between the author's confidence in her peripatetic abilities and her knowledge of how her activities would be reported and perceived by others. Refusing the label of singular female in someone else's narrative, she nevertheless owns a sense of singular per personal accomplishment when she claims for herself the title of queen. Wheaton's emphasis on how perspective and genre shape the meanings of gendered mobility remain relevant, I think, for a modern audience. As scholars of mobility, we often encounter our subjects through the types of circulated narratives that Wheaton dreaded. Our ability to understand the contours of mobility, social and cultural meanings and historical context is necessarily shaped and delimited by the availability of cultural materials, but also by the narrative force exerted by moments of dramatic conflict, tension, and change. I suggest that the scenes of everyday life related and apparently unremarkable artifacts like the diaries I've discussed today serves as an essential complement to the more sensational stories that made their way into public circulation. 
alongside the burgeoning discourse of the peripatetic poet and the heroic modern pedestrian, and alongside new and social, <clears throat> new social and perceptual possibilities offered by the railway and the evolving infrastructures of an increasingly connected Britain, a widespread yet often invisible fabric of everyday pedestrian mobility remained at work. Here we find a mundane activity that held incredible importance for 19th century women that created the possibility for adventure and promoted alternative understandings of physicality that facilitated intimacy with self, other, and environment. In tracing these strands of representation, I hope to have shed new, life on, new light on the female pedestrian and expanded our perceptions of what it meant to move through the world as a woman in the 19th century. Thank you.